Uh, it's November 14th, 2023. This is a panel discussion, um, maternal gift economy panel discussion with NGL, uh, MG, E, M, and others. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. And Gwen is my. Yeah. Hi, Dylan. Hi, all. Thank you. Thanks for time stamping. I was worried I would forget, and I know that's important for for some some watchers later on. I'm um I'm Gwen Olton, and I'll be guiding or moderating our our two hours here today for, yeah, uh, small is not enough. Um, is the title the maternal gift economy as radical alternative to exchange and accumulation panel discussion. And yeah, I'm so grateful to be with each of you um, today, the panelists and, and all of us here. I'm just imagining the effort that it took to be here <laughs> together because there's effort that it takes to be together um, all the time. And just imagining, um, yeah, maybe some of the things we had to move around or, or happen to get together. And um, yeah, grateful to those of you that will be watching the recording later. And even though I don't personally know each of um, the panelists, I'm really grateful to listen to you all deeply and um, support in whatever way I can. So happy to take any requests or um, hear if anything would be extra helpful or supportive as we're going through our time. Um, yeah, I wanna say a bit about our time together and just kind of the shape of the two hours. And before I do that, I thought we might just uh, do a settling practice together. I know it supports me um, as I'm starting things to just take a moment and settle in and breathe and imagine it might be supportive for others. So yeah, invite you to get comfortable and, and take a couple breaths if that works for you. Um, you could close your eyes or keep them open. Um, I've been working to learn more about the Haudenosaunee people um, who live with this land now and before my ancestors came here in what's called New York State now. And uh, one of the things that I've learned from the Onondagawa or Seneca people that are here and part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy is um, the practice and purpose of expressing gratitude at the beginning of something. Uh, that when we ground together in gratitude and, and name gifts that we've received from plants and water and animals and insects and the sky and, and one another and many more, it supports us in coming together and in and, uh, uh, being of good mind. So I wanted to offer just silence for 30 seconds um, and to hold in our hearts or in our bodies in some way, some gratitude or, or gratefulness. Uh, for anything that supported us, any gifts we've received that that supported us in being here today. Thank you. And yeah, I wanna introduce our panelists and I have been struggling thinking about how I wanna honor everyone. <laughs> with, um, yeah, seeing how, how much awesome work each of you are doing in the world and then also not wanting to, um, yeah, take up space that I'm really wanting to hear you <laughs> with, with a bio. So what I thought to do is um, I'd like to, to say your names and just say like the first line or so of, of your bio and then um, ask if there's something you wanna add. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna start with Selene and Sher Sherry first. So um, just so you so you know, yeah. So Selene, thank you for being here. Um, yeah, Selene as well offers public speaking, training, coaching, and modeling on the topics of gift economy, community living, nonviolent communication, and the Nonviolent Global Liberation Framework. Selene, mm -hmm. thanks for being here. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, I feel a little nervous to say it, but it is primarily what I'm bringing today. So I wanna add that I also um, engage in a relationship with the primordial mother or the divine mother 
Um, and that's where a lot of my inspiration for uh, my gift economy work comes from. Thanks, Selene. And uh, Sherry, who I'm just meeting today, um, thank you for being here. Sherry Mitchell is an indigenous attorney, activist, spiritual teacher, transformational change maker, and author from the Penobscot Nation. Thank you for being here, Sherry. Sherry, I'm wondering, yeah, if there's anything that you would like to say in this moment. No, that that's fine. We'll we will talk more later. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. Yeah. And Mickey, Mickey Cashton, who I do know, <laughs> is a practical visionary pursuing a world that works for all, based on principles and practices rooted in feminist nonviolence. Mickey, thank you for being here. Anything you'd like to share in this moment? Yes, I want to call attention to an ongoing tragedy that is unfolding now in the Middle East, where I come from, and the immense and overwhelming challenge that it is to maintain a non-violence perspective within when so many people, including people who generally are committed to nonviolence, are now polarizing and how much effort it takes to hold all of it with love. And I just want just even five seconds for all of us to be with that because the maternal gift economy is the antidote to that kind of violence. And that's why I wanted to highlight it. Thank you, Mickey. Letitia, yeah, Letitia Layson, welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, Letitia is a Filipina feminist futurist, priestess of morphogenesis, high priestess of Diana, priestess Hierophant in the Fellowship of Isis, Temple of Isis, Los Angeles. Welcome, Letitia. And I wonder, yeah, is there anything you would like to add in this moment? No, I think we'll have plenty to talk about. So my voice will be heard later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gwen. Thank you. And Genevieve, it's nice to you. It's nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Genevieve Vaughn is an American expatriate, semi autician peace activist, feminist and philanthropist whose ideas and work have been influential in the intellectual movements around the gift economy and matriarchal studies. Thank you for being here, Genevieve. Anything you'd like to add in this moment? Well, I'd like to follow Mickey saying that the, we are in not only now, but the terrible war that's happening now is part of a more general terrible situation in the environment and in the uh, in human relations between countries and um, and the future, because we don't know what we're going to be, how we're going to be able to survive. But I also believe that the gift economy, the maternal gift economy is the solution to that too. Thank you, Genevieve. And, and Cassie, Cassie Thornton, thank you for being here. Welcome. And Cassie is an artist and activist who makes a safe space for the unknown, for disobedience, and for unanticipated collectivity. Cassie, thanks for being here. Is there anything you'd like to add in this moment? I was just thinking of um, how lucky I feel to be with such an amazing group of people who all have um, cut out a very precise and special uh, set of roles in the world that don't not not there's not so many people that have um, have the idea and the language for what they do in such um, very like cunning magical ways and I just feel really lucky to be among all of you. Thank you Cassie. Thank you all. Um, yeah, so I just want to say a few things about uh, the flow, hopeful flow or map of, of our time together. So um, we have some questions for the panelists that you saw probably when you registered. And 
Um, we're going to speak um, on, on three different themes, or the panelists are going to speak on three different themes. There's interconnectivity with all of them. And we're going to start with um, two panelists, uh, Genevieve and Cellini, talking about um, kind of defining and describing the maternal gift economy. And then we will um, talk with and hear from first Sherry and Mickey talking about um, understanding the maternal gift economy in contrast to capitalism and exchange. And then we'll talk about vision and new slash ancient practices um, and hear from Leticia and Cassie. Each panelist will be invited to speak on all topics. We'll just we'll start with a with a couple a couple folks who will have um, about seven seven and a half minutes each, and then we'll we'll see about questions. I'm going to make one request to the to the group who's watching. Um, if you could, while the panelists are speaking, um, not type in in the chat. Some people find it like disruptive and and hard to focus um, on their words. Um, and if you have questions that are coming up, you could send them directly to me. Um, and I'll also try to leave some space um, during each section for some questions. I'm wondering um, from the panelists if there's any any questions any of you have or things you'd like me to cover or check in on, and Dylan, including you in that too. Think we're good. One, yes, I have one brief thing. This thing, uh, this event is being recorded. If you don't want to be recorded, you're welcome to turn your video off. Although, in the name of community and togetherness, we encourage you to have your video on. So, thank you. Thanks, Dylan. You told me that. Totally forgot. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I'd love to start. Um, with these couple of questions to Genevieve and, and Cellini and Genevieve, if it's, if it's all right, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, the, so the two questions we're holding in this section are, um, what do you see are the essential elements or aspects of the maternal gift economy paradigm? And the second question has to do with core principles um, and invite you to speak to, to either of both of those. And I'll, I'll put them both in the chat. Okay, shall I start? Yes, please, thank you. Um, I think the gift economy is, is a paradigm, the maternal gift e economy is a paradigm that has not been seen by uh, academia, by um, patriarchy, and even by mothers themselves even though they were practicing it. Yeah. And uh, it it is, as we have said, it is actually the solution to our problems because it has, is what has been forgotten, even though we're doing it. And uh, it is also something that has been obscured by the exchange economy. And we don't know that's happening, but it is. This exchange economy is actually parasitic on the gift economy. So every uh, child that survives has to be nurtured from the, her or his very earliest days. And um, it's not just the birth of the child that is a, a gift. It's actually the daily, minute by minute, satisfaction of the child's needs that is a gifting practice that goes on for several years and the child could not survive without it. Um, and that is a unilateral gift because the child can't give back an equivalent of what she's been given. So uh, it is an atmosphere or a practice in which the child is the receiver and the mother or the motherer is the, the model of what life is about. Mm. And, and so the child in receiving that understands life through that model of the mother. And in, in the, in, there have been uh, lots of new uh, research um, types of research on early childhood and 
what they say, I, I can't go into it all, much of it at all, but it does shine a light on what happens in those early years. And uh, when one of the things that they say is that there are a million, or maybe it's more than a million, maybe it's something like eight million. It's hard to 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 remember when you get up to those big to those big numbers. Uh, let's say a, a, a million and more um, new neuron connections that happen every second in the child's early life. And so uh, that is obviously whatever she or he receives and the way of receiving and how she has given and how her needs are felt and all of those things are very uh, indelibly um, uh, understood by the child be, just because her brain is is forming and functioning so uh, quickly and uh, in the, those early times, and um, and so that model is imprinted in in the child, and in the her own interaction with her mother, she or he uh, imitates and repeats the kind of giving she has received. And it's unilateral also. And they have these, um, uh, what they call serve and return interactions. This is the metaphor based on tennis. Uh, it's not an exchange, it's a giving and receiving. And actually exchange like quid pro quo doesn't start happening until children are about three or four years old when they learn that from the external society outside of their uh, immediate interaction with their caregivers. Um, and even if the caregivers think uh, that the child is gonna give back to them and take care of them in their old age, the child doesn't know that. So it's not, it, for her, it's not an exchange. It's only a giving and receiving relationship. And the, problem that happens is that exchange, which is uh, like, as I said, quid pro quo, which you don't get unless you give and, and unless you in, are going to give back, um, is an alteration of that original interaction. And that is a negative um, alteration that instead of uniting people as the gift does and bringing, bringing them uh, closer together and creating this relationship of uh, solidarity and trust, uh, there is a relationship of, of uh, I, I won't give you unless you give to me. And that separates the mother and the child or the child and somebody else or the adult and somebody else. So what happens is that exchange is the actual um, opposite. <laughs> of giving and receiving. And then what happens later on is that the exchange mode and people who are not doing giving and receiving want to receive, they have needs too, and they want to be given to unilaterally, even when they're not participating in any giving themselves. And that is what ruins our, our whole society. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we can, you know, um, base a whole philosophy on this, basing it also seeing how language comes uh, from the original giving and receiving way and not from an exchange way. Um, and our, I, I, call, I, I, I call us homo donans, the giving and receiving being, not uh, homo sapiens, because we don't know that who we are, really, so we can't, we're not wise. And, uh, uh, and so as, uh, as, and we're certainly not homo economicus, we're, we're a different kind of being than we think we are. And so we are acting out an idea of ourselves that is a wrong idea. And our, our 
patriarchy takes up this wrong idea and and uh, connected with the market um, creates a situation in which power over and um, an exchange separate people and create dominance and and submission. Uh, wh whereas the giving and receiving creates a uh, mutuality and a qualitative similarity rather than a quantitative one. Mm -hmm. So I think that my uh, 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 not 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 beginning talking with practice, but beginning talking with the uh, a change in ideas, a change in who we think we are is a, a, a necessary background for the change in the practice. And it, it makes it a whole lot easier to try to do gifting in real life with a different idea of who we are than it does if we're trying to do it without this maternal background. And we, there are uh, a number of gift economy projects out there that people do, do but they have not found the root in uh, mothering and unilateral giving and receiving that is universal for everybody. Actually, Jen, I think that might be a, a bit of a, a segue hearing some of the words you're saying to what I wanted to bring. Um, can I jump sure. in? Sure. Okay. Um, I think just in case uh, any of you listening want to hear um, like a simple one or two sentence definition of of what we're saying, the way I hold it is um, um, giving to needs that humans have, that humans have or beings have um, without needing to earn or give back. It's a it's a giving on the basis of needs and a receiving um, on the basis of needs. Um, that's not really what I wanted to talk about, but I wanted to just uh, plant that seed. Um, when I woke up this morning, what came to me to bring is I actually want to zoom out a little bit uh, from humans and think about the um, maternal giving as a, an organizing principle of the universe as I experience it. Um, and I think as our ancestors for most of human experience have also experienced it. Um, um, so the example I have is the sun. The sun is just being a, a star. It is being what it is. And in its being what it is, we on earth receive its gifts of warmth and light. That is the foundation of all life on earth, at least. Um, and similarly, trees are just being trees and in their beingness, uh, we are receiving the gifts that they offer. Um, and I think that similarly, um, humans, if we give ourselves permission to just be what it is that we are, what it is that we are is um, giving um, gifts to each other. Um, and I don't think that we need to learn something new. Um, I think that sometimes gift economy is framed as like a, the, an evolution of humans that we, of human society that we need to do. Like first we were living in a cave and then there was barter and then capitalism was like this natural growth. And if we maybe want to do gift economy, we need to like evolve spiritually or something. Um, but actually, uh, we need to unlearn, um, the things that we've learned under patriarchy and under capitalism because our inherent qualities as humans is practicing um, the maternal gift economy, um, which I think is some of what Jen was saying. Um, but the, the main thing that I wanted to get across is that we're a part of this larger um, universe that functions on the basis of of giving and receiving freely uh, without earning or without deserving just because we're being what we are. A baby is just being what they are when they're receiving fully. And an, a, a motherer is being a motherer um, when they're giving. Um, 
and um, it's built into our bodies. Um, it's built into the way that we evolved. And um, at our core, I believe um, that humans are loving, um, collaborative beings that uh, function on the basis of giving and receiving. Um, and um, we see it in Mother Earth. And also, I think we, we see it when disasters happen. You know, people automatically re kind of revert to this primal caring for one another. Um, and I would like us to figure out how to do that in the world that we are in without it needing to be a disaster. Um, so this is one of the things that I wanted to bring across is that it's the, the way I experience the maternal gift economy is it's life as a whole is maternally um, caregiving every other being. Um, and we're a piece of that. Um, and um, so the other thing I wanted to bring across just to, to share this is a story from my walk this morning. I went for a walk to just self-connect and connect to life, to connect to what I wanted to say. And um, I've just moved to a place where there's some prairie that's being restored. And I'm more, I grew up around trees. So it's a new experience for me to be around tall grasses. Um, and as I was walking, there's these kind of mowed paths. And sometimes the um, grasses lean into the paths and I'm used to trees. So I usually avoid them. Like you might avoid running into a tree branch. <laughs> um, but uh, the sun was shining and it was beautiful morning, warm, glowing light. So I wasn't really paying attention to my immediate surrounding. I was like looking at the light and wondering what the mother was going to want me to bring to you. And I actually felt a touch. I, um, you could say I bumped into um, a grass um, or you could say I brushed up against the grass, but the emotional quality of what I experienced and also the tactile sensations of what I experienced, it felt like being lovingly, tenderly stroked on my cheek by a nurturing being. And it was just a, a, a single moment. Um, and there was this oh, feeling like a, a relaxation and a, oh yes, this is what I'm wanting to, what I'm being asked to bring to you is um, that the, we can learn about um, the mothering, being mothered uh, and the mothering relationship through observing the mother child, but also we are within a larger womb um, that is the earth, that is the cosmos where our needs are being met. Um, air is given to us, water is there and et cetera, et cetera. And in this case, you know, loving touch was there. Um, and I want us to remember that it's an actual, it's not an idea, it's an actual physical thing that's happening. The earth is producing food that we eat. I'm clothed in things that were given to me. Um, and um, so this is one of the principles that I wanna bring across. It's not, it. we think about it and we talk about it, but it's a tangible physical thing that's happening on a daily basis where our needs are given to by life itself. Thank you, Genevieve and, and Selene. I wanna, yeah, check with our other panelists and see if there's pieces that they wanna, yeah, chime in on or additions that they're wanting to make um, to what was shared. Maybe could you repeat the questions uh, yeah. for the panelists? Yeah. So um, we had two for this. What What do you see as the essential elements or aspects of the maternal gift economy paradigm? And what are some core principles of the maternal gift economy? Yeah, Maggie, go for it. Um, the piece that I want to highlight, and it's related to both of what uh, Jen and Selini said is the quality of needs is that at any given moment, they are finite. We've been trained to believe by the homo economicus model 
that needs are infinite and insatiable. That needs are actually finite. And if we are living outside of scarcity, we will feel when a need is fulfilled and will know not to ask for more. And if we are really attuned to others, we will also sense when our given giving is sufficient because there will also be cues. So there's something about maintaining gentle clarity about what really is needed and not give and receive, not more and not less than is needed, that is crucial for the flow to uh, unfold. That is the piece I wanted to add. Yes, Sherry, please go ahead. <laughs> I wanted to um, thank you. Thank you to both Genevieve and to Selini. It's beautiful to see your faces. Um, thank you for your comments. And I love the, you're bumping into the grass um, statement. Um, we try to remember here that we're living in the home of the land um, here at Wajukum Tiltina. Um, I just wanted to highlight one thing that Jen said that I think is so critically important is that uh, we have this amazing amount of development happening in the first two months of life. And that uh, within that first two months of life, um, the child's basic stability, their emotional stability and their capacity to be centered and grounded and feel a sense of safety and belonging on the earth is established. And so there are a lot of scientific studies that show that if a child has been exposed to um, you know, trauma in the first two months of life and then has calm for the next 12 years, they're going to behave as though they had been in trauma the whole time because their neural pathways were developed around that trauma. If the child has calm and peace and a sense of safety and balance and, you know, uh, uh, peacefulness during that, that time, um, then even if they have 12 years of trauma following that two months, they're going to be more emotionally stable. Uh, than, um, than the first child. And so when we're thinking about, um, and this is something that I talked to my son and daughter-in-law about before my grandson was born. And for the first three months of his life, they only let one visitor at a time come to see him because they didn't want to overcrowd him as he was making facial recognitions and learning where he was safe. Um, and he's the happiest, happiest little boy. Um, and so when we think about what we're giving birth to, that aspect of loving it into being becomes critically important. And we're in the early stages of birthing this, this maternal gifting economy. And we're all in the initial stages of doing this together. And so the, the sense of loving safety that we cultivate in this moment is critically important to how this stands on its own as it grows and develops. So I just wanted to add that little bit before we move on. So thanks. Jerry, Letitia, go for it. I want to thank Genevieve and Celine for your fabulous words. And I just wanted to add and make explicit what is implicit, that the maternal gift economy is something that you can't do alone. I think that's the most challenging uh, notion that Westerners in particular um, have a hard time letting go of. But it is implicit in the notion of mothering. And I just wanted to make that and point that out, that as adults, um, we need to remember that the development of the maternal gift economy requires other, where the other is different, not bad different, but different than yourself. It's another yourself. 
Um, the other piece I wanted to add in relationship to that is relationship. We cannot have the maternal gift economy without understanding uh, the development of relationships and levels of intimacy. You know, we can't have the depth of knowledge of the entire world, but we can have an understanding of relationship uh, sampling of the world in our local communities. And when we explore those relationships with the gift um, and the fundamentals of the gift economy, we can make an easy extension to shift the world. Great ball to you all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Genevieve and, and Salini for, for going first as well. And um, want to shift us into um, this next set of questions and would love to start with you, Sherry, if that, that works for you. Um, there are three questions that we, we put around here. Um, I'm just going to name them and um, I'll put them in the chat and invite you to, to start by speaking to it. <laughs> whatever is most alive for you. Um, so it's, uh, in what ways does the exchange and accumulation economy make gifting so invisible? What are some of the impacts of that? Where do we start and how far can we go within the capitalist patriarchal system that currently exists? How do we shift gifting from coerced, taking gifts, et cetera, to voluntary sharing gifts? Yeah, and Sherry and Mickey will will speak here. Yeah, and Sherry, thank you. Yeah, I, I want to thank, first of all, whoever came up with the questions um, and then say that I, I didn't really resonate with any of them <laughs> in what I wanted to talk about. So I'm going to go rogue. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that's probably okay. Um but I do appreciate, you know, the framing and the ability to get the thought process moving. Um, I want to start out by just acknowledging um, what Mickey offered at the beginning and this notion that um, we are living within a reality where we are being forced to soundbite horror. Um that doesn't give us an opportunity to truly be with our grief, which means we're not able to take a deep breath. And, um, you know, when we can't take a deep breath that impacts all of our, you know, functional organs. Um, and there's it's just so much going on in the bodies of all of us right now. And I wanna presence that and just acknowledge that, um, you know, one of the reasons why the maternal gifting economy is so important is, um, you know, because the world desperately needs a loving mother. We desperately need a loving mother to be um, overseeing the out of control violence that we're seeing on the planet. And so when I think about the maternal gifting economy, um, I don't think about it in economic terms. I think about it in matricultural terms because I'm from uh, matricultural people. And so, um, you know, the next thing that I, I would like to do is to just introduce myself in my language to put myself in alignment with, with my lineage with my ancestry, uh, to acknowledge all those who came before me that uh, made it possible, all those mothers and grandmothers who made it possible for me to rise up and to be who I am and who I'm continuing to become. So, um, hello everyone. And we see one of the things that I want to talk about um, my name and my language is one of uh, my family is Bear Clan from the Penobscot Nation and Crow Clan from the Passamaquoddy tribe at Zibayik. Uh, and I'm very thankful to be able to, to share this time with you today. Um, and so when I think about the differences within 
these um, ways of being. Uh, one of the things that I think makes it incredibly challenging um, as we try to move into a gifting economy or a gifting way of being, a gifting way of life um, is for us to recognize that um, we've all been conditioned by the apparatus of colonization um, to um, outsource our caring for one another, right? So we, one of the primary functions of colonization is to create a childlike dependency within the populace on the systems of the colonial governments. And so when somebody's hungry, we send them to a food bank. When somebody's um, you know, struggling with the amount of overwhelm that we're all experiencing in the immensity of grief and trauma and fear that is present in the world right now, um, rather than bringing them in to a heart-based place, we ship them out to mental health counseling. Um, we outsource all of these aspects of caring for one another, and we have built systems upon outsourcing, and we've patted ourselves on the back. Look at how clever we are. We have now been able to outsource all of these uh, aspects of our humanity. Uh, and we think that that's progress. But what that's doing is that's creating distance between us and our humanity. And the maternal gifting economy is really about being closely connected to our, our humanity. It's about being closely connected to our heart space, our heart-based wisdom. Um, it's about caring for one another in real functional and practical ways. If we start thinking about this in too uh, esoteric a way, or, you know, these like big lofty visions of we're going to change the whole economy and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Um, we will quickly lose our steam. But if we start thinking about it in terms of how can I, um, shift my way of being to include more small kindnesses, more small expressions of care. Um, and how can I move away from the social norms of cancel culture and this global expression of lateral violence towards an expression of lateral kindness to create a community of care that I am actively a part of? I think that those are the things that for me come up when I'm thinking about the differences between these two ways of being between the capitalist system and a, and a maternal gifting economy. Um, but also recognizing that we spend so much time thinking about all the reasons why this couldn't work, that we prevent ourselves from actually doing the things that could work. Um, and I'm just going to give one example of something that, um, that I've done that I continue to do in my life. So I, um, I was a very young mother. I was a teen parent and I had a very, very hard time, um, being raised by my children, um, because I was so young and it was nearly impossible to get a good job. And I came out of a history of pretty deep family trauma. Uh, and so I didn't have the skills. I hadn't had, I didn't have the means or the capacity to be able to deal with my trauma. Um, I didn't have an expression of what it looked like to be the type of mother that my children really needed because I had not been properly mothered myself. Um, and so, you know, over, over time, I was able to find sources for those things in the form of other women who took me under their wing and loved me into being in ways that I had not experienced. Um, all of these beautiful aunties and grandmothers and surrogate mothers that adopted me along the way. Um, and, uh, you know, I consider Jen and Letitia two of those women who um, I feel like, you know, just put their arm through mine and said, come walk with us and invited me on this journey. And so I, I had this experience one day where I was having a real proper pity party and was feeling really sorry for myself when my children were small. 
Uh, and I saw a woman walking down the road, pushing a carriage who was clearly homeless with her child. And it was November. It's November here right now. And it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Um, and I had this awareness, this deep awareness that I am struggling. I don't have a bed to sleep in. I'm sleeping on the floor um, at the foot of my daughter's crib. And I can only afford to feed myself once a day, right? Um, in order to make sure that they have three meals a day and can go to childcare so that I can continue to work and <laughs> repeat this cycle. But I have a roof. My children are being fed. They're being lovingly cared for. In that there is privilege. And recognizing that even from that place of feeling a sense of lack, there was still something that I could give. And so that year I started um, adopting another single mother who was struggling and helping to uplift her during the holiday season. Um, and we just had here at Wajukum Tiltina our annual single mothers brunch where we had 30 single mothers that were here who we will now sponsor for the next year, helping them through the holiday season, mentoring them, connecting them with other mothers, giving them trauma workshops, grief workshops, helping them to learn how to manage their emotions with their children. Like all of these things we're giving for the purpose of uplifting and supporting the birthing of a new way of being on the planet. And to me, that, that birthing process that we're in is the most fundamental part of creating this gifting economy? How do we create beings who are capable of living in it? Um, and I'm getting the time limit thing here. So the last thing that I'm going to say is um, that, you know, to me, this feels like a muscle that has atrophied under capitalism and colonization that we are now rebuilding. And um, you know, there is going to come a point in time if we stay on the sa this same trajectory where it will be the only way that we survive. And so the building of this muscle and the expression of this way of being, um, the adoption of this way of, of knowing and being in the world is to our long-term benefit as a species if we want to continue to exist on this planet. Um, it is the only path forward for us. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Mickey. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. I want to just take a few seconds to take in everything you said, especially at the end. Um, and I actually do want to talk about economics because I think we stay away from economics at our peril because when we stay away from economics, we leave it to the classical economists to decide and determine and make sense of things for us instead of making sense of things for ourselves. So I want to say a little bit about patriarchy exchange and accumulation, or actually in a different order, patriarchy accumulation and exchange, and then talk a little bit about what we can do from here. So I think about patriarchy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, almost literally. Um, and I look at it through different lenses at different times. Most recently, I've been looking at patriarchy as a system that constricts the movement within and of bodies. That there is a way that movement is forbidden at all levels. It starts with children. Children are told how to sit, how to not sit, how to move, how to not move. And gifting is flow. When I give to you, I give you whatever I give you, and I also give you the energy of the movement of something um, that the giving itself is energy. When I give to you, that energy now lives in you and wants to keep moving. This is what the flow of resources in all of life is, as I see it. When we accumulate, when we begin to accumulate, which I see it as being the result of the patriarchal turn, 
patriarchal turn brought us scarcity or was grounded in scarcity. And then when there's scarcity, we lose the, 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 the sense of enoughness and then we want to accumulate. When we accumulate, there is less that can flow. So it encrusts resources in one location, in one person, in one country, in one um, uh, warehouse, in one something, and it doesn't move, and there's less for everyone else to share if they're still even trying to share. That's what accumulation does to uh, constrict gifting. And exchange is a different element, and it's really, really tricky because it looks like Jen said, it looks like giving and receiving, but it isn't because the giving and receiving are tied to each other from the get-go. The give the 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 when I give in order to receive, neither the giving nor the receiving are in relationship. Everything is instrumentalized. And the movement of the energy gets canceled. When I give to you and you give right back to me, there's nothing that actually moves in the system. It's like the smallest movement possible. So that is one way that I see accumulation and exchange interfering with gift. There are many other ways, and we can't talk about everything. So I just wanted to give this as an example. And in terms of what we can do, starting in this moment, wherever we are, there are various things that we can do in order to restore the flow of the maternal gifting. Only few of those we can do on our own. I am really grateful to Letitia for reminding us of this. But there are things we can do on our own. One is to uncouple giving from receiving. So that when we give, we give unilaterally and release. That is something that we can all practice wherever we are. Release whatever we give, not expect anything in return. We increase flow because then we leave that energy with the other person. Second, when we need something, to ask for it, to be willing to receive what others give without giving back. Because if we give back, we block the energy. If we allow somebody else to just give to us, receive it, and pass it on somewhere else in some other moment, not even related necessarily to that thing that came to us, then the energy begins to flow. It's not even microscopic. It's nanoscopic, and it's still movement. It counters, it antidotes the encrustment and the instrumentalization of the system we live in. That's... Those are two of the things we can do. The third thing we can do is we can become conscious of our needs and adapt what we put into us and around us to what we actually need, no more and no less. It's a very rigorous and difficult practice in a society in societies most all, almost all over the world. We are bombarded with consume, consume, consume. That's how we, you will be happy. The last thing we can do for those of us, I mean, there's more, but the last thing I will say at the moment, for those of us who are who have accumulated resources, there's a difficult practice. Genevieve did this, I know, over many, many years. The practice of de-accumulation. Deaccumulation is not philanthropy. Deaccumulation is you give the basis, the what is called principle. Everything that you have, you give it and you keep to yourself only what you really need. It is such an inspiration for me to be looking at someone and to be calling someone a friend who has done this, because I know no one else who has done this, to actually release resources back into the flow. And that's what we can do individually. When we come together, we can actually prototype 
an, uh, an actual maternal gifting flow, which uh, Selini and I are both part of a community, the community that put this together, the nonviolent global liberation community, where we are practicing restoring the flow of gifting on two different levels at the moment. One is how we deal with money. So all the money that comes to us comes as gifts. We have never once charged for anything that we have offered to anyone. That's number one. And number two, once money comes to us, those of us who sustain the work of what happens within uh, the NGL community, we distribute resources within us. And it's now about 20, 25 people who distribute resources. Uh, is it one minute? One to two, okay. Distribute resources based on need. So there are people who contribute hours and hours and hours of work and don't need anything. They have other sources to sustain themselves. They don't receive anything. In fact, there's at least one person I know who works many hours every week and also gives significant amounts of money to NGL uh, regularly. That is that is unheard of in the world of exchange. What do you mean you do both? And we all know that if, for whatever reason, one day she no longer has those resources, then she will be fed and sustained. That's what the actual gifting is. So this is this is a little bit of what, what we are trying to do to restore this flow. Oh, and the other flow is who does what? We have no bosses, no organization, no legal existence, no board, nothing. Everybody comes together in small teams to take on things that need doing and do them. Like Gwen came to be a moderator because somebody asked her if she's willing to do that. And she said, yes. So everything that happens, happens on the basis of willingness, need, and capacity and aligned with purpose. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you, Sherry. Um, yeah, I wanna invite panelists if there's aspects of what they shared you'd like to add into or um, yeah, pieces of the questions you wanna contribute to, go for it, Genevieve. And y'all, please feel free. You don't need me to tell you to speak. <laughs> Just do I, it. I wanted to add to something that Mickey was saying about accumulation and um, I've been interested in the idea of value for a long time. And I think that um, when mothers give to children directly, they give them value. And the child has self-esteem from the these gifts. Um, and in exchange, we give value to the objects, to money and to the commodities and not to the people. But in the fact that surplus labor, uh, for example, is actually uh, free to the capitalist, free, it's a gift to the capitalist from his or her point of view, if not, if it's also exploited from the giver, but it's uh, something that's taken and received free. So I believe that the capitalist receives that as giving him or her value like the mother's gift. And so that is one reason for greed because people are not given value in our society through gifting very much. And, and that hidden gift that's given to the capitalist um, encourages him or her to uh, continue to try to exploit more. And that's just because we don't understand the psychology of giving and receiving. And so accumulation means that you're very much loved. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks, Jen. Yes, Selena, go for it. Um, I just wanted to share a short story. Um, before I do that, I wanted to add to or, or re frame a little bit what Sherry said about caring for mothers. Um, as a quality of the maternal gift economy, I see, I think, less about centering children and more about centering motherers, which then centers children um, and, and care for those who are, I want to live in a world that cares for those who are doing nurturing nurturing the nurturers. Um, but what I want to say is um, about capitalism and as a parasite on the gift economy, um, I, I want to um, uh, underline that gift economy, the maternal gift economy is what the world functions on, um, but capitalism takes credit for it <laughs> um, and charges you for it. Um, and, and I learned this, it really landed in my body a few years ago when I was working as a barista in, in Ireland. I had just started reading Jen's book. And so I was just heard this framing of capitalism as a parasite on gift economy. And I was like grappling with it. And like a few days later, my boss came and asked me to work a shift that I didn't really want to work, honestly. But the language that he used to ask me to work this shift was like, oh, you'd be doing me such a favor and I'm so worried and stressed about this. And it was like framed as a gift. And that's where I was then more intrinsically motivated to do a thing I didn't actually really want to do. And then the person who benefits from it though is the people who own the business, <laughs> you know? Um, and so this is where it started to land for me. And I just really want to underline it that, um, gift economy is how the world actually functions and we just sometimes don't see it. And that's why I really wanted to have this conversation. I was curious about what some of you wonderful, amazing, intelligent women would say, like, how is it actually that it becomes invisible? Like what's happening that makes it invisible? I see that it's invisible, but how is it becoming invisible? I really would love to hear about this. This is me asking a question, I guess. Is this the section where we talk about that? Because I thought that was one of the questions. You can talk about whatever you want, Selene. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone who wants to answer that, go for it. I have a, a, a bit of an answer. Part of what makes it invisible is the framing that is available to us to understand human action is based on the homo economicus model. And within that model, it is always assumed that people only do things for personal gain. It's just an assumption, and that assumption is built into how we see things. So whenever somebody does something that is an actual gift, it is explained away as, um, as a something that is not that is for personal gain. That's one mechanism. I'm not saying that's all of it, but that's one small mechanism that makes it invisible. I think this is a really in, in interesting question, and I've thought about it a lot. I don't have, I can't tell you what all of the things I think about it now, but but it's, it's like uh, giving has been reframed as uh, saintly. Uh, as uh, you know, moral, and not as a basic function, uh, and so uh, it's and it's a, like an individual um, uh, quality, but it's actually the human way, and so we don't we don't even think that it might be an alternative to exchange or the basis of exchange. And exchange really takes gifts because that's what profit is. It's the gift or the free part of the, the work or uh, that has given has created this product. And and so um that is that's how gift is not seen because it's named profit. And <laughs> we have all these other words that name gifting in a in another way as part of an exchange system. I was just thinking about how like um the other day 
I had, I, I got COVID again and I was really sick. And um, one of my friends uh, who was visiting was taking care of me and he was like making me soup and um, getting me groceries and doing all the things that I couldn't do. And then at the end of the day, he was saying like, he felt kind of weird because he didn't get any work done that day. And, you know, it's like, it's, it's funny, but like, um, I think we've really internalized a value system that says that like all of the work that allows us to reproduce ourselves just doesn't really count. Um, I mean, and that's what the larger system definitely says. Um, and it does have to do with power um, and um, whose work has counted over time. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's even among, I think those of us that really privilege care work, you know, more than anything, I think it's still hard to sort of just see that as um, valuable because we've been so trained to see what's profitable or what creates a spotlight as being um, valuable. And I've been, one thing I wanted to just add to something that Mickey was saying before was um, like you were saying, you're, I love this, this idea of um, like movement and like patriarchy blocking movement and gift giving, producing movement and producing energy. And I really believe that. Um, and I think like something that I've been thinking a lot about is like how in certain conditions doing care work produces energy. And in cer certain conditions, it doesn't. And a lot of conditions, it's incredibly extractive. And um, and I guess just one thing that I, I like wanted to bring in is just like thinking through the economic and social conditions that means that um, the work that we need to do can produce um, the energy we need to kind of continue versus like the moments when it doesn't. And um, I don't know, I just I think it's like a, I've been I've just been thinking through like what it would mean um, the kind of absurd, absurd, but real wish for all caregivers to be cared for. Like, what would, what would it take? Um, because I think we need at this point, um, with the level of disaster and emergency that we face on so many fronts and more elder people than ever are, you know, people are living longer at the same time. Um, there's just so many forms of care that are necessary, but yet like, I think one thing that I have noticed in my work is just that um, the people that do the most care work often um, have a really hard time asking for support or getting care themselves. Um, so I guess, I don't know, I just wanted to kind of drop it in there. <laughs> Thank you. Sherry, yes, please. And Letitia, I know you have your hand up too. Yeah, please. <sighs> I am happy to defer to my sister who's not had an opportunity to speak this round. Letitia, if you want to jump in first. Please go, Sherry. I'll go after you. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I just wanted to highlight, um, well, two things. I, I think that one of the things that we need to really be aware of is that there is a lot of privilege in the ability to be able to intellectualize and theorize these issues. Um, and that the inequity and injustice that is present in the daily lives of so many people that prevents them from having the space to even contemplate um, what we are having the privilege to be able to talk about today is one of the primary issues that needs to be solved in order to be able to advance gifting, um, you know, and we can't flippantly dismiss the racial injustice, inequity, the economic injustice and inequity, the, you know, bias based injustice and inequity that is flourishing all over the world and expect for this, this to advance. Um, and the other thing that I want to add is that, you know, we are living in a time where the need to be seen has become a psychosis and, um, what is our need for visibility? Like, why do we need to make this extraordinary? Why can't this just be part of our ordinary life? And um, can we become more loving, caring, gifting, nurturing, cultivating, um, 
supportive human beings. And um, I, I think that that's that that whole aspect of visibility um, oftentimes becomes a target. Um, so I'm I'm all for less visibility and more proliferation in the underground network. So. Thank you, Sherry. That that was a good laugh for me. <laughs> I'm going to go back to Celine's um, question about why isn't the maternal gift economy seen? You know, how does that happen? And um, I'll just tell a short kind of brief story. Um, you know, I was raised, and Sherry can relate to this, I, I was raised uh, in the segregated times in the United States. So I've had the experience, and people are always shocked to hear this, that I've had the experience of uh, being separated, having to live by the graces of the Native American people on the reservation. When I was an infant, we could not live in town. And um, because I don't have a funny accent, people just assume that I you know, have a mentality that's very Western, but I was raised in a culture with a mother who was in, in a family that was healthy and loving. And the mothering was shared by my siblings and my father and all of my aunties and uncles. It wasn't a single mother orientation and it was impossible to have that. And as I was growing up and learning to speak language, there was a necessity to acculturate me in a racist, capitalist, uh, um, sexist culture. And it, and it was an onus on my family to ensure my safety. But in my childhood, the maternal gift economy is present. I just, to me, it's normal. You know, how could, how could anyone even imagine that it's not normal? It's normal for me. Um, I had to learn. So I think that, that uh, humans become acculturated, sort of uh, having to wear glasses. You're forced to imagine that you need glasses to see the world reality through this lens that's patriarchal, capitalist, imperialist, colonialist. So you have to learn all these different things that are anti-human in order to be successful in an anti-human world. But who really wants to live in an anti-human world? And what Sherry had said earlier about remembering, you know, I think that um, it's such a deep knowing I think that we don't have language to describe the maternal gift economy effectively to orient us in its wholeness. It's not just about the economy of money. It's really a, a paradigm of livingness that uh, it orients us in such a way that those who actually live outside of the gift economy know, I mean, outside of the uh, um, exchange capitalist economy look and can't figure out why people who are in it can't see that they're in it, don't even know that there's something else. And so our challenge has always been, I think, to bridge uh, communication. And some of that communication, Sherry has talked about it, uh, Celine has talked about the relationship, the mothering, it's nonverbal because the connection is a felt, grounded, uh, undescribable sense of safety and belonging, which is why the gifts flow freely. When you belong, then nothing needs to be accumulated because it's all everybody's, mm -hmm. right? So um, that's what I'd like to say Celine, about that, that it is because uh, we forget 
that we are in a paradigm. Intellectually, we know it because there's all these words that we say. But the embodiment of actually walking in the world and seeing what's real is challenging. And Sherry just nailed it. It's excruciatingly painful because people cannot see what's right in front of their face and they think that they're doing good and what they're doing is separating. So they continue to perpetuate something that dehumanizes us all. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I'm taking a lot of notes and taking things in. Yeah, grateful. Um, yeah, and actually, Leticia, if you'd like to start with the with the next the next questions, um, you and and Cassie are up. And again, I'll I'll put these in the chat and just read them out as well. Um, how can we create communities? that fully embody the maternal gift economy. And I, yeah, have heard <laughs> some of some of your response to, to this already. Um, what are some examples of transitional practices? How do we connect our small experiments in the current reality of global crises? Is it enough? How do we bring about a shift to a system that emerges from the maternal gift economy paradigm? Yeah. Oh, you're muted, sorry. I was so happy I got these questions because um, as a small child, you know, I visioned the world that we are to live in. So that has been something that has been a lifelong pursuit of mine. And um, let's see, how can we create communities that fully embody the maternal gift economy? You know, Mickey was describing certain things that we can do as individuals, which is true. There's the internal skill set that's required. If we need to have other ways of speaking, we need to have new ways of languaging and new ways of communicating. And we need to integrate that uh, non-verbally uh, and also non-violently. Um, I think that nonviolence is critical in the maternal gift economy. I had a mother who, I, I've shared this story often. There were five children. We all thought we were the special one. <laughs> there was, you know, there was no non-special child in our family. And, um, and it takes a remarkable human being or actually just a skill to be able to see the gift that every child has to offer as a mentor, an adult, a parent, an elder, to allow that to blossom. And what that means for the person who's actually creating that space for the individual to unfold in with the notion that in that relationship, you are creating a community and you are embodying the maternal gift economy yourself. So you can't... You can't create a community embodying the maternal gift economy unless you yourself are embodying it. All right, that's number one for me. And so um, you don't wait. You know, it's a very Buddhist thing to practice every single moment of every single day the maternal gift economy. And when I use the word practice, it takes the pressure off of having to hold a moral line with the maternal gift economy. If I don't get it right, you know, I make a repair, I course adjust, I do it differently the next time. And I engage other people in, in my new understanding. So I continue to bring people along. It does, for me, um, it, creating community is not just about uh, creating, a, well, first of all, I, I'll admit I'm a groupaholic. There isn't a 12-step program for that, I will say. But I participate in lots of groups because the collective expression um, impacts transformation in such a dynamic way that an individual cannot actually 
unless, of course, you're an enlightened being, and I, I haven't met any, and even the Dalai Lama says he's not in, an enlightened being. So I haven't met any enlightened beings. Um, and I, I just want us to feel the courage to reclaim the childlike curiosity that we have. The, the innocence that making a mistake isn't because you don't know enough, you're wrong, you're bad, you're a failure. It's because you didn't know what you didn't know. And if you didn't know what you didn't know, then there's no blame. There's no shame. There's just a not knowing. And so as we create these um, communities of the maternal gift economy, we need to sort of uh, gather around us. So I'm going to use it. I'm going to throw in some science because when I get stressed out, I read physics. So um, in, in chaos theory and quantum physics, when you're actually trying to change one system to another system, there's a dynamic that happens in the flow. And in order to shift the system, one point has to be so strongly grounded in the new system that you become a strange attractor and slowly but surely you begin to influence all the other little molecules and atoms and they come, they like to be around you because you feel so good in yourself and you feel so certain in life and they just start collecting around you. And then all of a sudden without any external effort on your part except for being, you've changed the world around you. So if each individual person is being who they need to be in the world, then you don't have to try to explain, convince, analyze, analyze, you know, uh, habitu rehabituate, really just walk in the world as you fully and truly are. Now, honestly, in this time, I know it's really challenging because to be open as yourself in the world with all the challenges that are going on, it can be very painful, but I'll just give you a tip um, from my first spiritual teacher. And she said, you know, you create around you a semi, again, science, like a cell, a semi-permeable boundary. And you need to remember you have the power to let in whatever it is you let in. But you have the opportunity to release as you go along, as you grow, but you create islands of sanity and safety around you. And you begin to collect people around you and you choose, consciously choosing to be around people who will allow you to explore and experiment the outer edges of the best of you. Not just to be in places where people are holding you while you're weeping, but you need people who are collaborators in your visioning process. Not just be with you in the struggle. You want to be with people who, in those moments that you choose to be together, an hour, two hours, everything else is set outside the door so that you can truly vision in a place of safety where the rest of the world is outside. Because we cannot actually become who we want to be. We cannot truly see something new unless we have the courage to let go of what is. And we need to be safe in that place. We also need to have people who play with us. I just saw something on the internet. I see Darsha is in the room with us and she can give us more details. Evolve Nest, if you haven't heard of that, you need to go look it up. But that play is so critical and actually allowing us to feel the safety and have the courage and the curiosity to be different to engage with others, and it settles our nervous system so that we can go back out into the world 
and actually walk centered and in confidence. Now, here's the other thing I want to give you, just so that you remember. You don't have to give all of yourself or your opinion to every single person that you differ with. Because when you begin to engage with people, you create a relationship. There's almost 8 billion people on the planet. You can't possibly engage deeply with 8 billion people, but you can choose who you will engage with. And I fight with people who I deeply love because I care about being in the struggle with them. So people that I don't love, people that I don't know intimately, people who don't know me, who think they know me, who want to tell me who I am, I have, they have no idea who I am. They, they have a projection of who I am. So I just want to give you permission, not that you need my permission, but just an awareness that in this world with the maternal gift economy, people are going to think you're a little woo, you know, or a little woo woo. They they think you're woo woo, but you want to claim the woo. So woo woo is crazy and woo, like woo ji, you know, in Chinese medicine, it's like, it's like the life force energy. It's like the magic of the world. It's the unseen, invisible that creates thought to form. So there you have it. And uh, thank you for listening. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Leticia, you really set me up. <laughs> I really feel like you just wrote all the chapters of all the things I wanted to say. Um, and you gave such good words to, to so many ideas that I wanted to share. So thank you. Um, I am a bit of like a mechanic who's been working on the same social project that's very related to what Leticia was just saying called The Hologram. And um, the web, I'm just putting the website in here for, for later. Um, and basically, um, I'm just going to explain a little tiny bit of how it works. And then I can say a little bit of what we learned that relates so much to what, like literally what Letitia was saying. Um, so basically it's a practice where one person asks three people for support. And um, it's about, it's a question asking ritual, basically. So I have three people, I've invited them to meet with me every season. And we've been meeting about for three years. And uh there's a ritual involved that's quite structured, but basically one person asks me social about social stuff, one about physical stuff, and one about mental and emotional stuff. And then um, my job as the person receiving all this care and attention is to make sure that each of those three people have support as well. So one big part of the project is knowing that the people who are giving you support have support, but it doesn't have to come from you. It doesn't have to come through exchange. The one thing I just I really think is really amazing that Letitia is saying is this this idea of having um, having support and attention um, to actually figure out your wishes and your desires and what you're here to do. Um, and in the hologram, there's this big focus that like we're asking questions of somebody and we're meeting together over time. So like over time, like, you know, I've been in the hologram of, of two other people for about three years as well. Over time, you start to really see somebody, but this project um, is a project that's not about solving people's problems or, or seeing people as problems, but actually really trying to understand their wishes and desires and at, keep asking them about it um, and trying to understand how they feel and why, um, and over time, um, becoming a kind of like living medical record for another person. And the one of the big projects or one of the big wishes of the project is that um, basically like we have a kind of long term support that can go underneath all other forms of support. Um, so when you may, might lose access to the medical system for one reason or another, or you move or you have a a divorce or you, your life changes, you have this sort of like, like sustained support over time. Um, and so now we've been practicing it. Um, many people around the world have been practicing it for about three years. Um, and it's viral and rhizomatic. 
And the idea is that we um, we make a kind of like more of like a culture of care than like like little circles of reciprocation. So like I have three people that support me. Those three people have three people and so on. And it's, it's not always so neat, but um, we do see how it it moves between people quite fluidly and it's slow. Um, but I think the some of the things I want to connect back to Letitia are like um, it's a it's a question based practice. So it's about learning to ask really good questions, learning to ask for help and then learning how to be curious, curious about somebody over time. So this childlike curiosity is really important. You don't have to ever be an expert or give advice. So the pressure is off. You can give care and receive care without a power dynamic. Um, I think that the in the process of doing the hologram where one person is getting support from three people at a time, it means that someone can enter into a caring or supporting role who might not have been socialized as a carer, because we know that like a lot of care work is divided along like gender and race lines. There's many people that might feel like too privileged to do care work. But I think like the, the point that we're at is that like, like many people actually need practice. And so this is a project where we get to practice together. Um, and the pressure is never on one person to do, to be a hero or to save anybody. Um, it's much more of a kind of like team game. Um, I loved maybe one of my favorite, well, no, there are many favorite things that were said so far, but one of the things that I loved was uh, Letitia saying that you can't create a gift economy if you don't embody it. And I think that like the, the, the thing about the hologram is just like, it's like what, uh, like, I think Genevieve has practiced it by giving lots of um, resources away. Mickey and Salini practice um, by the way you live in community and the way you're organizing resources. Like, I think the hologram is just another thing to, that people can practice and you can just walk in and practice. And I think like remember a bunch of these after feed muscles um, around sharing and interdependence. So it's it's just actually easy. And I think the thing that as as the hologram is, has grown as a project and it became like more of like almost like an international school or something, we always go back to working from the inside out, like doing the practice more than talking about it. Um, and like, mm, yeah, I mean, I, just, I think that there's like, just like a really big shift from like a patriarchal way of like theorization and like knowing everything to just like actually having a practice that you can just try and move around in and feel and shape as you go. Um, so this has just been a big, a big, uh, a big learning curve, I think, just in terms of like, if you want to organize something that grows, um, in a way that is human and slow and deep that, um, working from the inside out, like working through practice first has become really important. Um, and I think like maybe the, one of the last things I wanted to say was that like, um, I think the theory of change that I have sensed from watching people um, be a part of a rhizomatic care network over a couple of years is that um, something that that I think many of us have said so far today is that like nobody, nothing changes um, through individual, uh, like no, nothing changes just through individuals. But I think that there's something about having um, collective habit changes um, that we can actually see that is like, that is kind of the theory of change that I think has kind of grown on us who practice it. So that like, um, like these little things, like being able to ask for help or um, being able to separate um, giving and receiving from like this, these ideas of like debt and owing and guilt and shame, um, or even just like little stuff like um, uh, <laughs> being able to plan like far into the future through our relationships and through by asking to plan together um, that I think there's all these things that we can like, we can develop habits and those habits when we do it collectively, they do change things. Um, and it's been really interesting to watch. And then I guess the, like the very last thing is that the, the, the big wish of the hologram is that like we create support structures for each other, um, which require us to talk to each other, to ask for things, to negotiate difficult 
uh, to, to, to negotiate around energy and resources. Um, but there's a longer or there's a bigger wish, which is that I think we want a kind of long term stability so that we can actually also take risks on behalf of other people. Um, and I think this is what we're actually seeing now is that um, over a couple of years of having like long term support of being seen, of being able to talk about your wishes, of knowing that you're going to have attention, like somebody in the world is going to actually really see you, that you actually get really much harder to fuck with. And I think like, you know, it's it's really amazing. And I think um there this is what we kind of need is that like we actually do need to sort of feel like our roots are planted in something that we really believe in um so that we can take risks and uh you know work in ways that are not necessarily like valued or uh work like Sherry's saying like continue to do work which is invisible um which is important and not need um, so much external gratification or bright lights shining on us to, in order to know that it's good. Um, yeah, so I think I leave it there. Thank you, Cassie and Letitia both. Yeah, for starting us off on, on this section and super curious to hear from other panelists what's coming up for you hearing hearing what they shared or yeah, responses that you're wanting to share to these questions or anything else. <laughs> Selini and Genevieve are excited. Yep. And Sherry. Yeah. Go for it. Um, I can say briefly, I just, um, I think it's connected to what I was sharing earlier. And another thing I've been waiting for the section to bring this is um, I think that we need um, creation stories like of uh, that reflect the mothering or the gift economy. I think, and, and uh, we see this in indigenous societies, but I grew up, unfortunately I had, really unpleasant experiences in a Christian church at a vulnerable age and the stories that are told about how the world came into being do not reflect uh, a safe and nurturing place to be. And um, connected to that stories about what it means to be human, for example, what Genevieve said about gifting being considered a superhuman trait rather than a normal human trait the stories that we tell ourselves culturally about what it means to be human and about our place in the world and the way the world responds to us, I think is really important in framing the choices that we make, the systems that we design, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is what I wanted to bring. Um, Sherry, you look for going next and then we'll scoot over to you, Genevieve. Is that cool? Okay. You go for it, Sherry. I always defer to my elders. Go ahead, Jen. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm getting pretty old. Um, so yeah, I think that we need to remember where we are and what kind of society we're living in. And, uh, you know, we have the military, industrial, and then the academic complex that we're living in. And academia does decide on the parameters of the morals and so on of, of, of the people that go to, to school. And there are a lot of them. And, and so the gift economy does not appear there, except in some uh, framed in some ways that render it exploitable. <laughs> so I, I think that what we need to do, and there are many ways, I think we, we need to have a really uh, many pronged approach to bringing the gift economy into the world. And so it needs to happen in a lot of different ways and levels, just like you all are talking about and, and many others that we maybe don't know yet. Um, anyway, I think that we need to implant the gift economy, the maternal gift economy in the academic world. So as to make those people who go to school, the people that then become uh, capitalists and successful in that, already have that idea in their minds that, that capitalism is not good, 
that and and spread as as we have as has happened with feminism men now realize that that patriarchy may not be exactly as good as they thought it was and uh, even though it hadn't stopped wars or and patriarchal behavior but still the the, the ideas are spreading and so uh, we need to spread the idea of the gift economy. We need to practice it at all different levels. And um, uh, so that that is what I have tried to do, at least in the, as, as an academic, which I am not really one. I'm an external but I, uh, to uh, academia. But I'm trying in different academic venues to introduce the idea of the gift economy as explaining things better than they explain it with their kinds of abstract reasoning. So there, I just wanted to say that. <clears throat> Thank you all for these, these offerings. Um, it's, it's so good to be here with you all and to hear you and to share this time and this space and um you don't have to be within the confines of academia to be a scholar jen and i think that you are one of the most incredible scholars that i've ever known so i'll just start out by saying that um uh, and then also i just want to really highlight the fact that you know the patriarchy that we're talking about the wounded damaged patriarchy is the expression of the male energy without the gift of its feminine heart. Um, you know, that we all have these dual uh, and uh, non-dual, I should say, aspects of our being where we are both aspects of the sacred feminine, the sacred masculine, and that imaginal space in between, that, that non-binary space in between where all things are possible. Like we're all part of these this uh, multiplicity of being that um, we don't have time to talk about today. Uh, um, I just want to mention that there is there is such a thing as a healthy, balanced patriarchy. Uh, we just haven't had the privilege of seeing it. Um, and so um, there are a few things that I that I would like to say. Um, uh, one of my favorite authors is Kiowa author and Scott Momaday. And one of the things that he says is that we are what we imagine. Our very existence consists in our imagination of ourselves. Um, and our best destiny is to imagine at least completely who and what and that we are. And the greatest tragedy that can befall us is to go unimagined. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking about what are we imagining? You know, and Letitia was saying how as a child, I imagined um the world that I, that I wanted to inhabit. I imagined um, my way of being in the world. And so um, I had this incredible privilege of speaking at an environmental conference a couple of times with Frances Morla Pay. And one of the questions that she asks is why are we collectively co-creating a world that none of us would individually want to inhabit? And this goes back to this imagining, right? And um, there was uh, a recent Angela Davis quote that um, I saw in a book that was talking about um, leading with love. And one of the things that she talks about, who, you know, is known as just a total badass um, in her primary roles within the world in her younger days, is now saying that the most radical edge is healing ourselves. And that, um, you know, that we have to imagine the kind of society that we want to inhabit and that we can't simply assume that somehow, someday, some way, magically, we're going to create a new society in which there will be new human beings. We have to actively be involved in the creation of that. And so the question that I have in this moment is, how do we stop blaming and pointing out the water that we're drowning in, describing it in eloquent terms and start taking responsibility for becoming humans that are capable of living in the world that we imagine. So can we think about 
the world that we want to inhabit? What does it look like? What does it feel like? How do people relate? How do they talk to one another? How do they care for one another? And can we become those human beings today? Because the world is not going to manifest itself without us becoming the container for possibility for it to emerge. And I think that um, that's one of the things that, that we have to really think about because what we grow, what we feed grows, um, you know, and I think that we have to really think about as Celine was talking about the creation stories that the stories that we tell become our migratory patterns. And this is something that I'm writing about in my new book. And it's like, what are the stories that we're telling? How are we tied to them? Um, and are we living for something or are we living in opposition to something? And deciding where we are on that trajectory of imagining this new way into being, we also have to be um, aware and responsible for all the ways that we're continuing to contribute to the energizing and the enlivening of the things that we most want to see fall away by focusing so much attention on um, describing and defining them. And so I just wanted to add that into the, into this uh, pool of imaginal selves that we're creating here together um, so that we can really start taking responsibility for what we're imagining. Yes, give me responsibility. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, Mickey, please. Um, I want to say that for many people, you know, Sherry mentioned earlier, not right now, but earlier, the uh, people who are racially or in other ways on the uh, extracted, exploited majority of the world um, know that we need each other in order to survive. Because when you don't have enough on the material plane through the exchange relationships that are completely colonizing the world, you know that you need each other in order to survive. It's the people who have access to, to material resources who live in the illusion of the possibility of living just based on our own capacity and our own resources. And to move from there to the gift economy requires a willingness to experience discomfort. And I didn't want this, this time of us together to end without mentioning that I don't believe that change is possible while remaining comfortable. And I, I will just leave it here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Selene. I just remembered a thing I wanted to say, and I want to practice trying to bring my voice forward, um, which is um, like a, just a practice or a how-to or a sharing what I'm doing. And it comes from what I said about creation stories and wanting to unlearn some of the programming that I received and remember um, myself as part of this womb cosmos that we live in. Um, and that is... Um, actually pausing to with my senses experience the unilateral gifts that I receive every day that we all are receiving every day um and if there is um charge or emotional challenge or trauma or something that makes it hard to experience that in a human to human kind of way then I I look for where I can experience it so for example laying in a ray of sunshine was a, a unilateral gift that I received a few days ago um, and I don't have upsetness with the sun, so I can actually on many layers feel it and experience it. And my trust is that by doing that with beings or places um, that I don't have that charge with, the um, emotional quality of unilaterally receiving can then transfer to humans or places where it is more difficult. Um, so it's kind of like a creating a pathway um, that I can then use um, where it is more difficult. Um, so I wanted to just mention this as a as a as a thing that you can do if um, if you're finding it hard to imagine yourself 
receiving without earning or receiving without believing that you have to deserve it first, where can you find that where that doesn't get stimulated? So enjoying a flower, for example, you know, there's so many things that you can do. Um, and I just wanted to share, this is what I'm focusing on. One of the things I'm focusing on right now as a practice. Yes, Genevieve. Um, I just wanted to sort of add to that, you know, that, that you were talking about the sun shining on the earth and giving unilaterally. But if the earth had not created the trees and the, all the grass and everything, then there wouldn't have been a receiver for the sun and us too. So we had the receiver side has been created and is creative. And this we have creative receiving. That's all I wanted to say. Letitia, please. Yes, I love that, Jen. I love creative receiving. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to just spin off of Mickey's uh, topic of discomfort and just, just put it out there. Uh, I left my, the corporate world, basically the capitalist world in 1996, and I'm alive to tell the story. So I, I want you to have courage. I wouldn't recommend the way I did it, but um, I want to affirm that it is uncomfortable. But the uncomfortable part of it is, you know, it's such a the curious thing. Um, we're uncomfortable with the unknown. And we're uncomfortable because it's different. But if we frame difference as not bad, difference as simply non-judgmental, something that is not like we've known, then we might have a better uh, opportunity to embrace the notion of being uncomfortable with the potential of it being something better. Thank you. It's 11.52 in the time zone that I am in. <laughs> so eight minutes to the hour. My, I'd rather not open up for questions that we probably don't have a bunch of space for. I think I was holding two questions that I wanted to post to the group. I think I will still just put them in the chat and um, encourage folks to take the questions with them, or you know, if you want to respond in the chat, that's welcome too. Um, and I will, yeah, see what else is um, alive with our panelists that you're that you're wanting to share. So these questions I just put in the chat are um, I had crafted them at first to ask to everyone. Um, so what gifts have you experienced? Everyone being um, all the all the folks here, <laughs> not just the panelists. So what gifts have you received? Have you experienced receiving um, during our time together? And what gifts are you excited to give as you leave this space? Um, yeah, and I'm just wanting to to pause and check in with our our panelists and see if there's something up or something else rising up in you that you're that you're wanting to share. An appreciation for you, Gwen, for doing a really impossible task um, of fitting six panelists and a conversation and depth and relationship and everything into a design for these two hours that to my mind really worked. Thank you so much, Gwen. Thank you. Felt really uh, very fun to make this and like so nourishing to share this space with you all. Thank you. Yeah. Happy to, yeah, hear from, from anyone, anyone on the panel, um, not necessarily feedback to me, just openness <laughs> to whatever, whatever is alive in you to share in this moment. I'm sorry, we didn't get to do the questions and answers. Yeah. Yeah. We, we should have had another 30 minutes or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, the ones that I was able to catch, I'll, um, I've got in the shared document already, and I'm going to try to put the rest of them in there before we wrap. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Um, Dylan had messaged me. I just want to name this quickly. Um, an invitation for the panelists to put any any links that you would like in the chat, and also just remind folks that the um, website um, for for this event has everyone's bios, and um, you can find some more information to to read more. Um, yeah, from our panelists, and I'm just going to put that put that in there. Okay, now I'll be quiet and leave some space uh, for others. I just loved the phrase, uh, when you belong, the gifts flow. I think Letitia said it. It just like, um, it really sticks with me. And I, it kind of like answers the question that I think I tried to messily ask at the beginning, like what are the conditions that allow like caring to create energy? And um, I think the answer is like belonging and uh, which is so, it's so metaphysical and so material at the same time. And I'm so grateful for that um, little little bumper sticker that I'll walk away with. I think I actually would be supported in hearing something from the observers. So if you could, I see some of you are doing it. If, if you could put in the chat something you're taking away, I would love to be able to see that. It would be really nourishing for me. Yeah. Ooh. And is there a way that people can contact us if they want to talk to us or write to us? If you would like that and would like to put your contact in the chat, that's a strategy I can come up with right now. And if someone has, has another one, yeah, feel free to put it out there. Well, I'm just... Uh uh, Jen, is there a way to contact you on on your website? Yeah. yeah then yeah. I think all of our websites are there. So if if there is contact in, contact information on the websites, then that I think that's enough. Yeah. I mean, you can still put it in the chat. People, I think, will be able to contact us if they want to. Mm -hmm. So I did just catch one question about accessing the recording. Um, and also I think there's a question about um, being able to share it. Um, Dylan, I'm wondering if you might just speak to accessing the recording. Um, yes, you will be, uh, um, if you registered, then we have your contact email and we will send you uh, the recording. As far as sharing it, if you would ask the people to register, then they would get access to it as well. I think that's how we're doing it. If anyone knows differently, let me know. Thank you. So, well, I'm partial to a, a one or two word checkout if the panelists are up for it of just, uh, yeah, how are you? How are you feeling? How are you doing as you leave this space? Um, yeah, wondering, wondering how folks are doing after this two hours together. Um, and I'm happy to start us off and maybe pass to you, Genevieve. And if you don't feel like doing this, that's okay. You can pass. <laughs> so I'm feeling uh, nourished and curious. Very excited to keep learning. Yeah. Pass to you, Genevieve. Well, I've loved it. I love all of you all. I love all of the people that are here on the, um, in the chat. And um, I, I think we need to have a organized institute about the gift economy somehow and and a a wonderful network of of gift economy people which we are already starting so there we are Leticia you up for going next there sure. I feel really grounded and so delighted and I can't begin to tell you what a gift it is to me uh, to be on this screen with these women, uh, meeting you, Gwen and Dylan, for your support. It just, uh, my heart feels full to overflowing. I can't wait for us to do something like this again, and perhaps in person in 2024. Let's just plan it. Let's do it. Okay. And for everyone else, so you can come too. We want us all to be together to see the faces. 
Yes. Mickey, how about you? And then Selini and Sherry. I am mostly in a place of wow, this actually happened because the the <laughs> the conception of this was in March. And it took all this time to make it happen. And then it happened. And then here we are and a whole bunch of people with us. So I am just really, really, really celebrating all that it took to make this happen and really, really settling in the wall of it. Thank you, Mickey. Thank you for making it happen, for, for beginning it and all of you all for making it happen in reality. Um, I'm feeling that post speaking, almost post speaking shakiness um, and sweatiness. <laughs> I don't know if maybe it's just me. <laughs> and um, um, a sense of joy. And I always feel joy when sharing about the gift economy. And I'm, I'm with you, Jen. I, I really want to be teaching more about this. You, Sherry, then Cassie, if that's cool. Thank you, uh, Gwen, for host for facilitating, moderating. Um, Genevieve, Leticia, Mickey, Celine, Cassie, for your offerings here today. Um, and I just want you all to know that you've helped my immune system. I've been very sick, um, kept all of my coughing off off the sound, thankfully. Um, but I feel like you've, you've boosted my immunity today with your radiance and, uh, I'm going to carry that gratefully with me out of here and, um, you know, continue. And I sent a message to Leticia, like, would you come to Tina, a community that means let's help one another, um, is a good place to host a gift economy gathering. Great. It would start with someone gifting us the space, don't you think? I have space to gift. Mm -hmm. right. mm, I just, I think it's so, yeah, I still feel, I feel like a more complete version of my original feeling, which is just so, I feel very grateful to be with a bunch of kind of mysteriously fellow travelers and to learn so much. And um I feel like about at least like 90% less lonely in the world, just knowing what all of you are doing and how you're thinking and seeing. So thank you all. And yeah, and thanks for all the the big and little labor that went into this. It's always more than it appears. Thank you all. I hope to see you soon. <laughs> oh, Mickey. Dylan, there's a request for posting the link to register so people can get the recordings. All right. All right, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Thank everyone. You so much. It's so yeah, great that so many people are interested. Our... Yeah. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> Hi, Genevieve. It was so nice to meet you. Thank you. Great to meet you. Thank you for facilitating. It was super. Yeah. Cool. Talk it's soon. Awesome. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Bye. We do ourselves off. Or... Well, yeah, we'll close. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.